All right, how many people in here are actually full stack developers? I'm just curious, raise your hand if you're a full stack developer. Awesome, awesome. Pretty much everybody almost. I'm Austin Collins, I'm a full stack developer. I love full stack development. Um, that's why I got into this project. Uh, I'm also a DevOps engineer, AWS community hero, and the creator of the serverless framework. <clears throat> There's clearly a, lot, clearly a lot of hype around serverless right now. Um, there's a lot of people talking about it, around serverless architectures. And this, this thing, this hype, feels very much like a movement. At least it has all the qualities of a movement. It's, uh, there's an open source ecosystem around serverless architectures for deploying serverless architectures, managing them. Uh, there's thought leaders in the space. There's huge technology companies all looking to participate somehow, and controversy even. Um, and I'd like to take some time just to chat about what is it? What is this serverless movement all about? Um, why it's a big deal, uh, and where it could be going, as well as how to get started. And before I get into that stuff, though, I, I'd like to take some time to, to tell the story from the beginning, at least the beginning from my perspective, because uh, that's the only story I, I know best. And this is, a, this is a tale of open source technological giants uh, and unexpected disruption. It was a dark and foggy night when I moved to San Francisco two years ago to build startups. Um, I didn't have a lot of money then, but that was okay because money doesn't mean happiness for me. Building stuff means happiness for me. And if you're that type of person, you go to San Francisco. Because it doesn't matter how much money you make at the end of the day, you're still not going to be able to afford anything, but at least you're surrounded by other people who like to build stuff. And that's what it's all about. <clears throat> now by 2015, the hype was in containers and DevOps. Um, but those weren't my personal interests at the time. I think containers, I think portability is a fantastic theme. There's so much great energy and innovation in that space. It's really exciting. DevOps, same thing. Um, super interesting. And I was moonlighting as an AWS consultant, so I was focused on that a lot. But I was there to build startups, and I had a different focus. I was focused on efficiency. Um, efficiency in uh, pricing and cost. Efficiency in time. See, after you spend a little bit of time in San Francisco, you quickly realize that it's an arms race over there. And that city is filled to the brim with startups that are moving at record pace. They're super competitive, as well as technology giants um, who are also moving at record pace because they've adopted all the startup methodologies like continuous delivery and microservices. Um, and uh, they're moving faster than ever. And they have, they have all the resources and capital in the world. After living in San Francisco for some time and seeing the software engineering landscape evolve, I'm not sure if I agree with this notion that a startup can outpace a big technology company anymore. I think that these technology companies, they could ship features just as fast as startups, uh, but also they have tons of competitive advantages, like really good data about what features to ship. Um, so I was new to San Francisco. I was absorbing all this, observing all this, you know, recognizing for what it is. It's an arms race. And I was looking for something, some type of uh, competitive advantage, some type of edge, something that would empower somebody like me with little resources to compete in this crazy hyper-competitive world. In late 2014, Amazon Web Services, the cloud computing juggernaut, introduced this new compute service called AWS Lambda. Now, in those early days, it was pretty raw, and it only had a few use cases. Uh, you could only do a couple things with it. But I saw that, and I said, you know what? This speaks to me. This speaks to my values. Uh, because for, to me, what it represented was a, a convergence of all the best themes of, in software engineering uh, of our time, all together in this new type of compute service, and that is uh, microservices. So when you deploy code in Lambda functions, you'll write code to perform a single job, and you'll upload that into a Lambda function. Like, for example, save a user to the database. You put that in a Lambda function, you deploy it, it's an independent unit. Then you write some more code to do another job, you deploy that in a Lambda function, like uh, update the user. And you deploy that, that's another independent user, unit. And you compose your application with all these several little functions, they're all independent units, units, all autonomous, and that is inherently microservice based. And microservice is, a fan is fantastic for when you're in production, it's fantastic for so many reasons, but when you're in production uh, and you need to be agile, it's a really wonderful thing to have your application as all these separate independent units. Because when you need to go change something, modify something, or add to it, you, can, you only touch that specific, uh, that specific component without affecting your system as a whole. And that's a great thing. 
uh, microservices also for teams to work autonomously on parts of an application without getting blocked by other teams. Uh, helps teams move a lot faster. So Lambda, because you deploy code in these independent units and these functions, is inherently microservices. Next up, zero administration. You deploy a Lambda function, and AWS will scale that out automatically for you. You don't have to do anything to make that happen. Um, this is where the serverless term kicks in. Uh, those servers exist, the developer doesn't have to think about it, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, next up, it's event-driven. You can set Lambda functions to listen to not only just HTTP requests, uh, except traditional web requests, but also lower-level infrastructure events on your AWS account. Like if you upload something to an S3 bucket, you could set a Lambda to listen to that, listen for like a put object event, and that Lambda will automatically process um, that uh, object that was processed. You could, you could set it to listen to Dynamo, DB tables, all types of stuff. And the developer doesn't have to manage, just like they don't have to manage like the um, uh, scaling uh, and operations, they don't have to manage the uh, setting the event-driven infrastructure as well. AWS handles all that stuff for you. So already some awesome qualities. Uh, also easy access to AWS services. Lambda is a lot like a PaaS, a platform as a service. I mean, it has a lot of qualities of a platform as a service. But unlike some of the other platforms as a service, with Lambda, it's really easy to access all these other services that AWS offers. I mean, there are some uh, PaaS uh, platforms as a service that are built on AWS, but they don't want you to know that, and they don't want to make it easy for you to access all the great AWS services. And what the other stuff that AWS is providing, aside from just compute, is incredibly valuable, and I'd say that's half the value of Lambda. And there's no easier way to use all of AWS's great stuff, like S3 and DynamoDB, um, then just to spin up a Lambda function and start working with that stuff. And lastly, pay per execution. This is the super interesting one for me. I mean, they're all pretty interesting. They're much more interesting combined, but this, was, this really caught my attention. So Lambda functions, you only pay whenever that code is called. You don't have to pay any flat monthly fee or anything like that. Um, you just put your code up there, and it's not going to cost you nothing until that code runs. And when, it's, and when it runs, it's billed at 100 millisecond increments. Now, for a pricing model, this is super disruptive, especially coming from AWS. Uh, I think that this pricing model alone is going to have vast sort of disruptive effects on cloud computing in general. But you take all these things together, and again, it represents this fantastic convergence of all these wonderful things. And I think the end result is this. I think if you have sort of a zero administration compute service um, that does all this stuff automatically and it's pay per execution, you've flattened the last few barriers between the developer and being able to provision infinite logic, right? Because if I don't have to pay for anything until it's run, and I don't have to really operate it, I could just sort of deploy these things, set it and forget it, I could provision code all day long, right? I could provision 100 Lambda functions a day, why not? Any sole individual or small team can provision tons of code, replicate it across regions, you know? It's not gonna cost you anything until that code runs. And that's an amazing thing to me, especially as a full stack developer, because it's like liberating your productivity, like never before. So I saw this, I saw Lambda, and I was like, amazing, I want to build everything on this right now. And it was still very early back then. Uh, I think July 2015, API Gateway came out. You could officially hook up Lambda functions, functions to HTTP endpoints. And I decided on that very day, I said, I'm going to refactor my entire startup to run exclusively on Lambda, and nobody was really doing that at the time. Nobody was trying to build entire applications on Lambda. That just kind of seemed crazy. Um, but I gave it a shot uh, because, again, that, that compute service, the total economics of that compute service was so compelling. So I started to do this, and I deployed my first few Lambda functions, and it was, uh, it was a little hard through the AWS dashboard. The AWS dashboard is complex. It's a whole bunch of disjointed resources. You have to go over here to look at something, over here to look at something. But I deployed a few Lambda functions, uh, and the end result was amazing. I felt super empowered. I felt like a god. And then <clears throat> I had to deploy a few more Lambda functions, and it got a little bit more painful. And then I realized, I took a step back, I looked at my project, I said, man, I'm going to need like 50 Lambda functions, you know, uh, at least for this entire project. Um, and 50 Lambda functions, that's a lot of little autonomous independent units. Um, the way you write de Lambda code usually is you make a separate folder for each function. Each folder has its own dependencies, code dependencies in there. And dealing with all that stuff 50 times over um, is painful, to be honest. Now, if you're a bigger company that has like a bigger microservices architecture, like Netflix, for example. Netflix, I think they have 1,000 microservices, over 1,000 microservices that power Lambda. 
Now, Lambda code is even more granular than I'd say a traditional microservices code is, because Lambda is really focused on a single job. At least that's how most people are writing Lambda functions today. And I think that if Netflix was expressed as Lambda functions, Netflix would have several thousand Lambda functions. But that is a ton of little tiny units, really granular units of code. Uh, so this is the problem I ran into immediately with my smaller project. All of a sudden, I had to figure out, like, wow, there's just too many functions here. Now, how do I share config across all these little units? How do I share code across all those things? How do I share resources, infrastructure resources that my Lambda functions depend upon? For example, these Lambda functions need access to this S3 bucket. These Lambda functions need access to this DynamoDB table. These Lambda functions have this IAM policy. That's crazy. It's, it's um, clearly a situation where entanglement happens quickly. Furthermore, then you want to replicate these Lambda functions across stages, aka environments. You know, how do you do that easily? Uh, and then, of course, manage all this stuff across growing teams. You know, what teams, how do teams work on these projects and, and, uh, and a growing project? So, I'll be the first to admit, to admit the world doesn't need another framework. But there was clearly no better solution for this problem than a framework. So, it was framework time. And, you know, there's another framework out there, but We've come a long way, and it's awesome. Um, and also, I think, I think what's cliche is often true, and that's kind of why things become cliche. So anyway, I started work on this framework, and this was like two days after API Gateway came out. Um, there's a Ultimate Grounds coffee shop in Oakland. Uh, they serve really cheap coffee there. I'd sit on the couch in the back there, and I'd work on this you know, every other day. It was just like a, a little hobby thing, but then <clears throat> I just became obsessive about it, and I kept working on it more and more. And after a few weeks, uh, I wanted to brand it. I have a design background, and I love giving software a voice and an identity. And I wanted to give it a big brand, because to me, this felt like a big deal. If you could actually pull off applications, entire applications on Lambda, uh, you could do so much. So I, I came up with this JAWS brand, because the project felt like a blockbuster, and I wanted to carry that message uh, through it. So made this cool Shark logo. Uh, next up, at that time, I had only read one blog article uh, it was written by Tim Wagner, the general manager of AWS Lambda. And it was the first time where I had seen someone describe Lambda as serverless. The line was something like, you could use AWS Lambda to build truly serverless backends. And I saw that, and I was like, I like the way that sounds. I mean, that's really, that really resonates with me. Um, it, those servers exist. The developer doesn't have to think about them. And developer experience is, is just the most important thing, especially when you want to build really efficient solutions. Um, it's tools that get out of your way like that. So I saw that, that article, and I was like, that's a cool word to describe what's happening here. And then I looked in the comments, and the comments were mostly positive, except for like one or two people in the comments who just could not stand that the word serverless was be, being used when there were clearly servers running in the background somewhere, and these people were furious about it. Um, <laughs> I thought, wow, look at these people. I can't believe they take this so seriously. This is hilariously controversial. Right? So I saw that stuff, and I said, you know what? I'm going to take full advantage of this. So I, I made a badge. I, I mean, I love badges. We're a badge-oriented uh, society. You can't go to the grocery store uh, without you know, buying stuff that has the right badges. You can't use code if it doesn't have the right badges. Um, and I started to make these badges, and I decorated the whole project with them. Um, and I sort of took it to the limit. So I wrote 100% server-free. That was one badge. Another badge on the project said, no servers guaranteed. I, re uh, re I redid the tagline to say, uh, the serverless application framework. And I said, fine, let's do it. Uh, I hadn't posted it anywhere at that time. Um, I said, you know what, I'm going to post this on Hacker News. It's going to get ripped to shreds, because uh, it's Hacker News, and it's full of like puritanical lynch mobs anyway. So <laughs> why not? I mean, life's short. Be bold. You know, I was riding high on you know, cheap coffee as an open source project. So anyway, I, I put it on Hacker News. I didn't have any expectations. You know, most 99.99% of all stuff on there doesn't get seen at the end of the day. And I posted it, and I walked away, and I just distracted myself by building a sandwich of epic proportions or something. And I came back, and like a few hours later, it was on the front page. Like number two position, hundreds of upvotes and comments, and the comments were all positive. And people were loving this. Um, they clearly, there was clearly a strong desire to use Lambda and to use it as much as possible, to build entire applications on Lambda, but people didn't know how to do it because there wasn't like a clear way forward. And this is what this project uh, showed those people. <clears throat> so, um, at that moment, the Hacker News post, uh, my life turned around. Uh, all of a sudden, 
like tons of uh, stars were coming into the GitHub repo, tons of issues. Um, I was like blog posts were being written about it. Uh, I was totally overwhelmed trying to solve all the issues and merging the PRs. I mean, it was, it was absolutely crazy. Every single day, like 30, 40, 50, 60 stars were coming in. Um, meanwhile, Amazon loved this because they said, wow, this is making it really easy for people to use Lambda to do all types of stuff. So Lambda got behind the project. They start, uh, Amazon got behind the project. They started promoting it. They invited me to all these talks. They invited me to reinvent. reinvent. They wrote tons of blog posts around, around it. And then, I don't know, maybe a month later, I ran into uh, this, this next problem. And that was, it turns out JAWS is uh, the name of a popular screen reader application. It helps the visually impaired uh, have access to computers via audio and braille. And all of a sudden, as the JAWS framework became more popular, um, it made it harder for the visually impaired community to find resources that they were looking for around their beloved uh, screen reader application. Um, and that was very frustrating to them. So I started to get these emails from this community saying, hey, please change your name. You're making it hard to find my screen reader application that I so uh, desperately depend upon. Um, and then I got tweets about it. And then they got into the GitHub issues and they were writing stuff about it in there. And then they were in the Gitter chat room. Um, and it became like a serious issue. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> I was dealing with that. At the same time, some of the best venture capitalists in the Valley saw what was happening. They saw the response from developers, uh, and they said, Austin, like, what do you want to do with this thing? We'd like to fund it. And I said, oh my god, this project, this open source project, it's, I wrote it on this couch in this cheap coffee shop, and now I have a chance to work on this full time and build a team around it and build all these great serverless projects. And I was telling them about this name thing, and it turns out that the screen reader application also trademarked the name JAWS. You know, we didn't run into issues with the movie or anything like that. It was mostly just this, this other piece of software. And they had a shark logo and stuff. And the investors were like, what are you going to do about this? And it's like, we want to fund this thing, but I don't know. You've got to do something about the name. Um, so I was thinking about it. I was like, ah, oh, I had to make a quick decision. And I thought, like, what is the best way to tell this story? Uh, I had, like, the framework. I had, by that time, I had 40 other serverless-related projects that I wanted to do. I mean, I'm such a fanboy in this space. And I went with serverless. It was blatant. It was obvious. Um, and we rebranded Josh to the serverless framework. And uh, a few months later, we established Serverless Inc. At the same time, meanwhile, on a parallel timeline, Amazon Web Services and the marketing, marketing machine they have there in the developer community uh, was starting to invest heavily in the serverless buzzword. Uh, and that was clearly uh, promoting it to, to everybody. Oh, this is, I had a. <laughs> I had a donation link on my GitHub repo, and because it had a lot of traction, and I was hopefully, you know, hoping someone would sponsor the project and help support me before I raise funding and everything. And the visually impaired community actually would donate <laughs> and and kindly ask me to change the name even there. So anyway, it's just one one thing after another in life. Anyway, so users and use cases. So immediately I saw uh, tons of interesting activity on the repository. I saw hobbyists come, start using for Lambda for different things that they were working on, the weekend warriors. And I thought, okay, they're expected. And then startups came, and I said, of course, this is, this is exactly what startups need right now. Uh, and then I saw big enterprise companies come and start hanging around the repository, um, start hanging around the Lambda community. And I thought, and these are Fortune 100 companies. And I thought, wow, this is weird. Uh, you know, I, I can't believe that they're here for something that's so, that's so raw. But at the end of the day, Lambda is nothing but EC2. It's just been rebranded, it's been repriced, remarketed. And it's basically the, the tried and true infrastructure that the enterprise has already adopted. So they've been quick to switch stuff over to Lambda. Uh, I mean, at a faster rate than I've ever seen the enterprise move before. Next up came consultants. Uh, consulting firms love serverless architectures because it's, it's a very easy thing to hand off to a client um, because a lot of the operations is, is, is eliminated from the picture. Uh, a lot of people from the container community would come over, um, also other application frameworks, Express, Meteor, uh, a lot of those people hang around the repository now, around the project. And at the end of the day, there's so much diversity, it's, it's so early still, but there's so much diversity and interesting people in this space. I think it's just because it's so darn efficient. That same efficiency I was looking for and that I found initially in Lambda uh, has brought everybody to the table. I don't think this is a fad. Serverless, this, you know, this isn't a fad. This is just like the logical evolution of cloud computing. 
uh, and it's like a 10x step forward. So that's why all these people are here. Meanwhile, the use cases started to vary like crazy too. So at first, you know, people were using it for data processing stuff, uh, processing uh, DynamoDB streams, something like that. That's kind of what Lambda was originally built for. Uh, and then they started using it for REST APIs, building entire REST APIs on Lambda. Um, and then IoT apps, of course, very easy to provision a Lambda function or two to manage an IoT backend. Uh, chatbots, of course, for the same reason. DevOps automation and tooling. I've seen amazing stuff that people are building to automate sort of their, their DevOps and their internal processes. People are building their own CI, CD systems. People are training Lambdas to auto-scale other types of resources. They're building their own pager duty stuff, uh, all types of things. Compression systems, people will make like a, an orchestrator Lambda function that'll spin up you know, tens of thousands of other Lambda functions to all uh, compress like a frame in a video or something like that. Um, and just amazing stuff. It's, it, there's, there's no end to all the types of things that people are trying to put in Lambda functions. And again, the reason is the same. It's efficient, it's convenient. It is like the most convenient cloud computing service around. So as a result, people want to use it for everything. Success stories. Soon after these crowds showed up and these use cases started to emerge, then success stories started to pour in. Now, the, the big ones usually are around apps with spiky loads. Uh, a lot of people will have applications They'll be paying you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars a month to keep these things uh, afloat on traditional infrastructure. Um, and of course, maybe they'll get a spiky load and all of a sudden that stuff will crash. They weren't ready for it for whatever reasons. Um, so a lot of people are converting that stuff over you know, right, to, right to Lambda. And uh, Lambda is reducing costs like crazy for these people. Again, it's you only pay for what you use. Um, so regularly, we'll see people who are spending you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars on something reduce those costs to a few dollars or even cents. Um, the best example, this is the newest example that I've seen, the best success story, uh, this just happened like a few weeks ago, is this thing called the census fail. The government of Australia decided to do the census online uh, this time, and they wanted to encourage everybody to go home to their computers, go on their website and fill out the census there. They spent $9 million creating a survey site. That's all it was, really. It was pr pretty simple. They contracted a big technology company to help them build it. They low tested it um, for tens of millions of people. And of course, when they, when they launched it, everybody came home from work, they logged on, and the website crashed. It was gone, $9 million. <clears throat> from the last I've read, um, they've, they've received so little input that they can't even really do anything with the census data because it's not a big enough uh, amount of data uh, in terms of like the entire population. So that whole thing pretty much crashed and burned. Meanwhile, a couple young guys at a hackathon at an Australian university uh, a week later said, look, let's just recreate the, the census website and let's build it on Lambda and, and see what happens. So they just went and they just uh, scraped, they copied all the HTML, they recreated the, the census website perfectly. They built a simple Lambda function in about 24 hours to handle uh, collecting the survey data, and then they load tested it against you know, tens of millions of requests. Um, and all of a sudden, their story went viral because uh, a whole bunch of big newspapers picked it up and it turns out they were able to do all of that for 250 bucks. Not only that, I called those guys immediately because I said, like, I love this type of story. Like, this is, you know, I'm all about the underdog and everything. And, uh, and I was talking to them about it. And they said, yeah, that press number was, like, we put it out there. It was really conservative. Uh, the real cost uh, was $30. Anyway. People are using Lambda today, big enterprise companies, and they're using the serverless framework to, to handle, to do billions of uh, Lambda function invocations a month. And this is happening right now. And the teams I see that are managing all this are usually one engineer, one or two sometimes, handling all this traffic. Uh, it's, it's phenomenal. So. Fast forward to today, uh, more serverless compute services are around. Uh, a lot of the big technology companies saw what was happening with Lambda and they said, well, we gotta get in on this. Uh, so now we have Google Cloud Functions, looks like an amazing service. Uh, Azure has Azure Functions. 
Also another cool looking service, IBM OpenWhisk Actions. Tons of other smaller providers are jumping into the space. Um, it's, it's awesome because there's gonna be more diversity here. Uh, meanwhile, Lambda is improving every single day. AWS keeps making it more mature, more stable, adding in fantastic features. Uh, another trend we're seeing now is that enterprise companies are making serverless teams. And they'll start out with like one person um, who's like a champion of Lambda or the serverless framework or something. Um, and the other people in the company will start handing them workloads. Like, hey, can you put this in a Lambda function? And that person's like, yeah, I'll put it in a Lambda function. You know, I'm done. And it's like 10 times cheaper than what you had. Uh, and like, I have more time to do other stuff now. So those, these serverless teams are growing. People keep handing them workloads. Um, and this is, this is an, an awesome trend. I will say, though, as far as costs go, uh, Lambda is, is definitely more expensive than what you can squeeze out of EC2 at a really high, at a really high volume. Now, that is if you're running you know, EC2 at like 100% utilization, which is, which is pretty rare. Um, and, the, and then the truth is a lot of people are running their infrastructure at very low utilization rates. Uh, and the great thing about Lambda is that there's no such thing as underutilization uh, because you're not gonna get charged unless that code actually runs. Meanwhile, Serverless Inc, 12 people. We've got 12 people now. Uh, it's been incredible. We've got some great uh, uh, VC firms backing us. Um, we're working on the framework every single day. It's been a year now just focused on Lambda um, and serverless architectures. Uh, serverless framework version one is coming out of beta this month. Uh, it's super powerful. We put in a lot of effort into it. Um, and for version one of the framework has only been, I'd say, feature complete for about a month, but already people are deploying about 30,000 functions with the framework uh, a week right now. All right, how to get started. Let's chat a bit, a bit about the framework. Uh, it's hands down the easiest way to do this. Um, again, we've been working on it for so long. It, it handles everything for you, scaffolding, automation, optimizations, uh, best practices, it's all baked in. Um, so it's a CLI tool, it's written in Node.js. Uh, you can install it with NPM. Um, and it treats Lambda as the focal point of AWS. So there are a lot of tools out there that help you do AWS stuff. Uh, what the serverless framework does though, is it has a theory. And that theory is that Lambda will be the focal point of AWS Cloud. It'll be like the foundation on which you will build most stuff um, on in AWS in the future. And it interprets AWS from the perspective of Lambda. Uh, and that's kind of our, our mission statement there. Um, <clears throat> so also with the framework, uh, it, it manages your code, but it also manages your infrastructure. So managing, you know, deploying, zipping up Lambda functions, that's only half the battle. Um, coordinating those Lambda functions uh, and making sure they're tightly coupled with other infrastructure resources that you're using, um, that's the other half of the battle. So this is a bit unusual of a framework in that it manages the code as well as your infrastructure. Uh, but the great thing is, you can provision your functions, uh, your events, um, all the wiring you need to like trigger these, these functions, as well as your infrastructure in one command. Uh, and it's really a beautiful thing. <coughs> Uh, and also, we do this because we're just an abstraction on top of CloudFormation. Uh, we didn't used to be embrace CloudFormation fully, but it's really come a long way. It now has support for all of the serverless features on AWS. Um, and so version one is built on CloudFormation and therefore much, much more stable. So, uh, did a lot of learnings in version zero. That was inevitable. We were trailblazing. It's a whole new world. Um, and we noticed a few things. Number one, Project thinking is kind of too big for this. It, it, it tends to lead into monolithic thinking, whereas we're very much focused on solving microservice problems in the framework. So for example, uh, we used to have a project where you put all your Lambda functions in there, and that project would share one CloudFormation template, which would define all the infrastructure resources that those Lambda functions would require, and it would also uh, have one REST API, one API, Gateway REST API, which all those Lambda functions would share. And that was cool for smaller projects, but then all of a sudden those projects grew and multiple teams would be working on these things. And uh, all of a sudden you have this person over here who manages the CloudFormation stuff, this person over here who manages the API Gateway stuff, and then your Lambda teams are saying like, hey, can you provision that infrastructure so we could like push this stuff to production? Or can you provision this endpoint so, so that we could test out our functions? Um, and so they quickly, quickly led to blocking issues. So this whole project thinking is, it's just not right for, for this. 
In our world, everything is a service. I, I don't even think that there's any real project level thinking anymore, application level thinking. There's only ever expanding networks of logic connected by events. Meanwhile, functions are too small. You know, if you just, you know, have a whole bunch of different functions, again, if you're doing like NPM install, if you want to install like a new uh, library or something and you have like 20 functions, that's NPM install, NPM install, NPM install, and that gets old really, really fast. Fortunately, what we noticed was that functions travel in herds, uh, in groups. And these are usually groups of like four or five functions, and the reason this happens is because these functions all usually share a data model. So in the example above, you can see the user's CRUD example. Um, here's a group of functions at the top, four functions handling, you know, each handles a, one of the CRUD operations. Um, and these things all share these infrastructure resources, so they kind of like travel together. Uh, so we came out with this serverless service concept. Uh, we have very few concepts in the framework. We're trying to keep it that way. There are functions, there are events, anything that could trigger your function to execute, and then there are serverless services. And a serverless service is the, is the middle unit of organization. It's a little bit smaller than a project. It's a little bit bigger than a function. You could have one function in a serverless service or multiple functions if you want. <clears throat> Um, but code infrastructure coupled ni nicely together. Uh, it's an independent cloud formation stack. So again, we're just an abstraction on top of AWS cloud formation. Uh, you get to define all this stuff really easily in a serverless.yaml file. So you have a folder, you have serverless.yaml. In that file, you'll describe you know, the name of the service, the functions, the events that trigger them, as well as the resources, the infrastructure that those functions uh, depend upon. Um, and this is just a really neat uh, unit of organization. Um, it's solved a lot of our problems. Uh, and whenever these things are deployed, whenever you deploy a serverless service uh, in one region uh, or another region uh, or another stage, you're just creating a separate cloud formation stack. And so there's just perfect, simply comprehensible uh, separation of concerns. All right, let's see if this demo works. I was trying the internet connection out earlier. It was a little iffy but let's dig in and see what this stuff actually looks like. So uh, serverless, it's a NPM package. Try and make that a little bigger. Um, you can install it with NPM install serverless. Uh, I'm not gonna do that right now because uh, it might be too complicated. So instead I have it installed on my machine, I can run SLS, I can see the commands it does. Um, first thing I'm gonna do is make a uh, directory I'll cd into that directory, and I will run, uh, you could type in serverless, uh, or if you are lazy, like most of our users actually, so you could do serverless create. Um, you could do, you just use SLS. So I'm gonna create a new serverless service right now, running serverless create. Uh, I'm gonna throw in a template, and these templates uh, specify the provider as well as the runtime. Now, Serverless Framework version one, we're expanding it to support multiple providers because there's all these new players uh, in the game. And they all have really interesting technologies and developers uh, deserve options at the end of the day. I mean, there's just nothing better than having sort of freedom in what you choose to use. So the first part of the template is the provider. The second part of the template is the runtime. I'm gonna make something on AWS in Node.js. Cool little serverless graphic. And now we have some scaffolding. Uh, very simple event.json, not really important for this talk, but handler.js contains our code, serverless.yaml uh, defines our serverless service. Let's open it up, let's see what it looks like. I'm sorry, that's a little bit small for you. Okay, handler.js, here's our code, here's our, here's our function. Um, in here, uh, we're gonna display a simple message and the event object, which is gonna, gonna we're gonna make a, a simple REST API endpoint. And the event object contains all the information about that incoming request, I'll put it in here. Uh, and here's serverless.yaml. Um, we put tons of comments in here to help you get started right away. I'm gonna rename the service real quick. Uh, let's see, users full stack fest two. Uh, here's some provider information. Here are your functions. There's one function called hello. Uh, it points to the handler, which is pointing to this file um, and this, this uh, function in that file. So serverless framework is gonna deploy this whole folder, this whole users folder. It's gonna send that up in every single Lambda function. 
So let's put uh, some events here. We need to trigger this function. We need to make it work somehow. We're going to uh, create an HTTP request. We're going to put in a path. Let's do users. Let's say this you know, as our users create function. Uh, we'll do method. Uh, we'll do the get method. Uh, and there you go. Everything that triggers a function to run can be tucked in under this events property here. And we're just going to set this up. Looks like everything is good. And I'm going to run serverless deploy. Let's see, we'll run the speed boost there. OK. So serverless is going to take uh, the functions. It's going to take all the infrastructure, uh, the API gateway endpoint that we just specified. It's going to put this together in a CloudFormation template and deploy that as a new CloudFormation stack. Now, the initial deployment takes a few minutes. And it's something that like, constantly bugs us. But at the end of the day, it's creating IAM resources on AWS. And those IAM resources have to be globally replicated um, before they're ready to go. Uh, so the first deployment is always the slowest. And while that's going on, I'm just going to chat a bit about uh, code patterns, uh, how people are like, partitioning uh, in Lambda functions. So <clears throat> first off, I talked a bit about the one job per function approach. And this is by far the most common. We call this the microservice approach. Uh, you take some, some code, it does one job, like this, this function resizes an image. You put that in a Lambda function, you deploy it, um, or this function uh, saves a user to the database. You deploy that, you put up uh, one, rest, one endpoint on that too, if it's a backend service. The next pattern is the services pattern, uh, which is a few related jobs. Um, people will put in a few jobs in a single Lambda function, and then use something like just the API Gateway dashboard or the serverless framework to hook up multiple HTTP endpoints to that single function. So this would be great for like a user's CRUD uh, Lambda function. You know, I just have like all the CRUD operations in the single Lambda function. And the reason why people are doing this is because Lambda has a bit of a startup cost, a bit of a cold start cost. And if you put more logic in a Lambda function, then the likelihood that it'll be called more often um, to keep it warm is greater. So this is why people are doing that. They're also, they kind of just want to get rid of uh, multiple Lambda functions at the end of the day, and it's a good way to consolidate them. So we see this services pattern. Uh, it's really easy to hook up multiple endpoints to a, to a function, like I, I just hooked up one endpoint. You can actually inspect the incoming request and put it like a little, like four lines of code, a router that says, oh, this incoming request is for the user create function, and let me route it in the, inside my Lambda. Uh, monolithic. People are actually putting entire applications in Lambda functions. This seems crazy to me. It seems kind of like going backwards, but people are doing it. And you know what? The power to them. You know, uh, Why not? The serverless framework lets you do all that stuff. Uh, go for it. Uh, the, graph, the graph pattern. Uh, I love this one because I'm just like crazy about efficiency and pragmatism. And GraphQL to me seems awesome already. You take GraphQL, you put it in a compute service that's pay per execution, zero administration. And that, is, and that is beautiful. So what this is, GraphQL, it's a library. You put it in your Lambda function. Uh, it sits in front of multiple data sources. Um, and so you take a single Lambda function, you put GraphQL in there, and you hook up that Lambda function to one endpoint. Right? You only need one endpoint. You don't need a REST API with a ton of endpoints anymore. You have one endpoint. And in there, you send a custom uh, a data request with a custom shape. And it could be requesting, it could be in that request, you could be querying multi multiple data sources and pulling in attributes from the resulting records, uh, all combined in this one request. So that, that incoming request comes in, it hits GraphQL, GraphQL queries all the appropriate sources uh, concurrently, it pulls in the data records, reshapes them to match the shape of your incoming request, and spits that right back out. Um, and it's, it's awesome uh, efficiency. I know there's another GraphQL talk uh, so I won't go into it in too much detail, but definitely check it out. We have a, uh, a secret project that we're working on that has a, a GraphQL Lambda function with that single endpoint approach. So we're using this pattern ourselves. That Lambda function actually sits ahead uh, in front of another tier of Lambda functions, which each contain a query that GraphQL does. Um, we first started to put all our query logic in a single Lambda function. That became like a monolithic Lambda. Uh, but by spreading these out in two tiers of Lambdas, um, it's working really nicely for us. Oh, no, we have an error. CloudFormation service may not be available in US East 1. Hmm. This is a uh, speaker's worst nightmare.
Um, I haven't done anything strange in here. We have our events, we have our functions. Oh, this is so frustrating. The magic moment is coming up and I can't, I can't get to it. All right, let's just look at this. While this is going on in the background, I'll try running it one more time. Oh, it worked, perfect, awesome. I don't know what was up with that before. I ran the same command again and it's working. So we deployed a Lambda function, deployed an endpoint, and, uh, and here you go. Serverless framework, it just goes and collects all this information for you. It returns it in the terminal. Um, and here's our endpoint, here's the ARN for our function as well. I will take this new endpoint. And if my luck will continue, what we have here is a REST API endpoint. Pay per execution, REST API endpoint, zero administration. You know, if I wasn't talking so much and blabbering, I could have done this in like a few seconds, or, well, a few minutes with that initial deploy. But there you go. What's happening here is that, uh, is that all the incoming request information is being passed right into the Lambda function, and we're actually returning all that. So this is all the great data you have to work with. Uh, if you try and do this manually on API Gateway, you have to like specify all these different things to like go into your Lambda function. Otherwise, that HTTP request uh, information will not be passed into your Lambda function. Um, and now, to quickly iterate on this, I'm going to take away this event stuff. So I'm going to say your function was updated. Just modify my function slightly, and. All I have to do here is use our new deploy function command, which happens a lot faster. <clears throat> there we go, I've just updated my function. I'll refresh, done, right? <laughs> that is a beautiful thing. You can hook up your Lambda functions to all types of events. You specify it in YAML. We're reducing um, like a, a crazy cloud formation template, which, th which normally would have like hundreds or you know, multiples of hundreds of lines to like 30 lines in serverless.yaml. Super easy to use. Um, and there you go. I mean, just build anything <laughs> that you want to build. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to cut the demo a little bit short. We're not gonna do logging or anything like that. Um, we do have so many other cool things happening in the framework though. It has a whole plugin architecture, so if you wanna extend the framework to do whatever it is you wanna do, workflows are so subjective at the end of the, at the, end of the day, uh, you could just write a plugin to overwrite the existing functionality in the framework uh, or extend that functionality. So for example, we're working on this plugin, it just watches your code every time you hit save, it'll just go deploy it in the background for you, um, and so you have sort of, sort of continuous deployments. Uh, where is this all going? Like, what's, what's the end game of this stuff? I really have no idea. Um, I have a few theories. Uh, what, what started Lambda was event-driven architectures. And the whole serverless movement is really kind of defining event-driven architectures where the compute services uh, are zero administration and pay per execution, microservice based. But AWS has been on this, this tear for the last few years of building uh, infrastructure services so that anybody can construct their own event-driven architectures easily. And serverless, the, the, the movement, I think, has kind of been a distraction from the cool stuff that's happening overall in, the, in your ability to build a venture of an architecture. So, you know, I, again, I, I don't think that there's any application boundaries in the future. I think that there's, there's just like the developer uh, and their ability to infinitely compose logic and uh, create these ever-expanding networks of logic all connected by events. I think other people will create networks of logic. These networks of logic can be combined and you can respond to other people's events. Uh, I also see huge opportunities for dry here. Um, I mean, just imagine being able to run other people's Lambda functions on a pay-per-execution basis, right? There's so much common application code that we write and rewrite for every single application. That stuff doesn't need to be be written over and over again. You know, your custom code needs to be written. You're like the, the stuff where you actually solve business problems, that needs to be written. But like sending out a transactional email, doing stuff like that, that should be written once and you should be able to run that other person's code on a pay per execution basis. I think that would be awesome. Uh, and that's it. Thank you, Full Stack Fest, uh, Code Graham. I mean, this has been a great, great conference.